Now, now I'd like to uh, turn to that most insidious technique used by both the Soviet Union and the European Union to secure long-term control over the people they have already subdued. And in specific terms, I want to talk about the dilution of national identities by mass migration. Am I ringing any bells here in the US? And where better to start than with my good friend Vladimir Bukovsky again, a Russian with far too much experience of a society held together by military force and who believed that the EU would copy the, Europe the Soviet Union in due course by quite deliberately seeking to create widespread civil disorder which it can then blame on xenophobia and right-wing extremism and all the rest. We are talking about social engineering to create a new environment with diluted identity and power concentrated yet more in the center. Cultural diversity is a very dangerous card to play in my view and governments both tyrannical and democratic for that matter have discovered the truth of that statement many times over. Where in history I ask you is there an example of mass immigration on a scale currently being experienced and which benefits or benefited the indigenous population. Is there ever, has there ever been an example of such an, an event? But there are many, many examples of the reverse and we don't have to go very far back, including in this country, uh, to see that. And in my own, the bitter fruits of diversity in Northern Ireland are still being picked over some 300 years later. In more recent times, the Balkans, Israel, several parts of Africa have seen massive population movements inspired by the state and as a result of state-inspired terror. And as a re direct result of governments attempting to interfere with the existing ethnic communities. Right here in the US, your current administration's open borders policy and its decision to ignore the enforcement of your own immigration laws is part of this broader agenda, I suggest. Because on both sides of the Atlantic, ladies and gentlemen, we are now all in the same boat. And I want to talk for a few minutes about Islam because that is the primary source of the problems that we have and I suspect you have. You see Islam here in essentially I imagine in the context of the Middle East and in terms of 9-11, Iraq and Iran. And I would like to tell you a little more about what lies underneath all that. Recently we had a an academic, an Arabist academic, come to the European Parliament. He has spent many, many years uh, in the Middle East and in particular in recent years in Iran. And he has made a very close examination of the educational material now being used in Iranian schools to brainwash their children. And for a change of voice, I'm going to invite my wife to come up and in a much better English accent than mine, read a half a dozen short extracts to you from that report. According to the Islamic understanding, a person doesn't convert to Islam since everyone is Muslim at birth submitting to God's will. One must remember that these beliefs are not evolved by human minds. 
The Iranian school textbooks thus provide an example of a hate curriculum and betray an educational system that prepares school children for war and martyrdom against the West in general and against the United States and Israel in particular. Israel, which isn't recognized in any way and whose name does not appear on any of the maps, is portrayed as a danger to the whole world of Islam and as a tool in the hands of its enemy, America. The war's goals, as stated in one of the books, are complete victory over the world of unbelief and arrogance, the eradication of any oppression, the appearance of the master of the age, the Shiite hidden Imam, and the realization of the world government of Islam. Exalted God orders the believers in many verses in the Holy Quran to fight the jihad in the cause of God and kill the oppressors. He gives the glad tidings of forgiveness and eternal paradise to anyone who becomes a martyr in the cause of God. He considers martyrdom a great victory. That was an extract from a 2004 grade eight school textbook. I don't think the world has yet fully woken up, woken up to the enormity of what terrorist in, um, aggression inspired by Islam truly amounts to or is likely in the future to amount to. Now, I, mu I must say before I get into this subject that I am not generalizing about all Muslims. Of course not. Many, possibly the whole, uh, the vast majority, are peaceable, hard-working contributors to society. What I am talking about is the fact that within their midst, there is a hard core of revolutionaries who are anything but peaceable contributors to society. They have mounted a war against our countries, and we have quite literally enemy guerrillas operating within our gates. And I agree with uh, one of your politicians who I saw on uh, television when we arrived two days ago. He made the point. He said, we are not facing a war against terror. I agree with him. This is a war of religion. Terror is merely the weapon. And terror is the weapon of choice of, of the Islamic extremists who want to take over, quite literally take over, the whole world. We are, in a sense, going back to the Dark Ages. And we are being obliged to defend ourselves against truly alien beliefs and ideas that others see it as their right to impose on us. They claim a God-given right to enforce their beliefs by mass murder. Where we use secular government and freedom of thought as pillars supporting a peaceable society, Islamists claim law and government are exclusively in the hands of God. More precisely, that means in the hands of fallible human beings who presume to act on behalf of God. Such claims are utterly absurd. They're utterly absurd to any rational mind, whether in the West or elsewhere. And such beliefs cannot reasonably be discussed with anyone who holds them. But even the threat from such fanatics represent a destabilizing force in our societies, precisely because they are fanatics and precisely because they regard death in their cause 
as glorious. Just look at their record. Since the turn of this century, they have murdered some 3,000 innocent people in New York, 200 innocent tourists in Bali, 333 children and teachers in Beslan, 292 people, mainly Africans, in two U.S. embassies, 300 French and American peacekeepers in Lebanon, 25 innocent travelers in London, 191 in Madrid, 200 in Bombay, and there's the half a million killed in Darfur, and the 4,000 Katyusha rockets fired into northern Israel by the Hezbollah. Ritual beheadings we've seen of hostages in Iraq, of monks in Thailand, of Christian girls in, in Indonesia. These Muslims stone their own women folk to death without the slightest pretense of administering what might be regarded as basic justice. They hurl the foulest of insults at the Jews and vow to wipe Israel off the map, as you've just been reminded. And if possible, to do it with nuclear weapons. This is an awesome list. And this is what has happened already. Since 9-11, Muslim fanatics have slaughtered over 26,000 people and wounded over 50,000 more in 6,000 separate attacks all over the globe. Now you may be say I'm overstating the link with terrorism, but am I? It wasn't a bunch of American footballers who flew into the Twin Towers. It wasn't a Welsh choir who blew up the London tube stations. It wasn't Irish navvies or, for that matter, Spanish farmers who de detonated the train in Madrid. It wasn't Hindus or Sikhs or Japanese. We have in the UK a man called Ali Bashir who sits on what is described as the UK Muslim Council. And he told Al Jazeera television recently, quote, there is no democracy in Islam. Democracy must be replaced by Allahocracy. We want, he went on, an Islamic state where Islamic law is not just in the book, but enforced. And I might tell you that according to the same television station, Colonel Gaddafi agrees with him. He told them, and again I quote, Allah will grant Islam victory in Europe. There are 50 million Muslims in Europe already, and they will turn Muslim, it into a Muslim continent within three decades. Now the Muslim community in the UK recognizes that the problem is centered on their young impressionable men and on the imams who teach them but they need to root them out and to do so quickly and with vigor because they are the only ones who can we cannot Muslims in the UK as immigrants come to our country to be a part of British society just as people come to your country to buy into the American dream now here, that tends to happen. In the UK, we have now got communities, large communities, who do not buy into the British way of life at all. They are becoming ghettos, large ones, inside the British community. The Muslim Council needs to stop claiming also that it is the real government of the Muslims in the UK. Can you believe it? At the last election, they told Muslims not to vote on the grounds that they were not part of the British community. Now, when you add such isolationist attitudes to the terrorism issue, there is only one possible conclusion, and you have to say it out loud, Islam is the problem. We have, can have we can ask ourselves, could there ever be such a person 
as a British Muslim, or for that matter, an American Muslim. Perhaps we should remind these advocates of death and destruction and the moderates who protect them that a truly revolutionary Muslim would be one who sought change in these attitudes and beliefs. But I think there's very little doubt of that. If things go on as they are, eventually we are going to face what in effect will be a civil war, at least to the extent that the indigenous population will forcibly try to remove significant elements within the immigrant population and what might start with simple lawful objectives like trying to remove and repatriate people who've overstayed their welcome, committed criminal offenses, incited violence and so on. It might start with things like that, but eventually we could be forced into some kind of urban warfare. And I would say to those people in my country that if you wish to establish Islamic law in the UK, the answer is no, you cannot. There is no place for you here. <laughs> Go and live where your lifestyle and your religious beliefs are accepted. There are good long-standing reasons, I believe, why we should make our reaction crystal clear. The only way for a people to retain control of their territory is by occupation. And allowing foreigners to take it over is tantamount to treason. Conflict over territory, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing new. History, indeed, suggests it is the norm. But look a little deeper and you'll find there is also good genetic justification for the parallel existence of distinct groups. Protection of the species, survival of the fittest, hybrid vigor, and particularly in the case of humans, we can also add development of the intellect. As a racial type, for example, we know that the Chinese are cleverer than Africans. In fact, they're cleverer than most of us. And H.G. Wells, the uh, author, forecast where that trend eventually leads. Which is why man has never tolerated large numbers of outsiders for very long. Past experience suggests a state of neutral uncertainty is about the best that might eventually emerge. But not if one group tries to overwhelm the other, which we now have in the UK and which I suspect you are facing here in the US. The rapid creation of new countries from heterogeneous peoples by legal means or any other is virtually impossible in the short term. We are not impartial beings. We have strong natural tendencies to protect our own. Eventually, instincts of survival will overcome almost all challenges, however powerful and however apparently lawful they may be. Your claim to the USA is that you are here your forebears settled here. They developed this great country. You now control it, at least for the moment, and you must defend it or lose it. Your nationalism, in the best sense of the world, is not necessarily aggressive towards others. For established communities like yours, it can be essentially defensive. What I am saying is that the nation is a natural unit for stability and it must be defended with courage and at all costs, whatever those costs might prove to be. Imposing our moral or cultural values on others is or should be unnecessary, but defending them from attack by hostile groups or individuals is absolutely essential and that is the situation we face on both sides of the pond. Now I want to turn briefly to some of the facts and consequences of what I've been saying about Islam. And in particular, I want to come back to the EU.
because under new EU law, the UK's doors are open to now nearly 600 million people living throughout the rest of continental Europe. We have no right to stop them coming to live and work in Britain. And we have a far more rapid population growth amongst migrants than we do amongst our own indigenous population. Since the millennium, over half a million British families have left the UK permanently. And that's the highest rate of immigra uh, em emigration since records began. And these Brits and their families have been replaced by a tidal wave of incoming migrants over that same period, in far greater numbers indeed than those leaving. Dr. Gillian Becker, who's a distinguished demographer and statistician, told a conference at which I was speaking last year that the British are diminishing their own stock of people. And it's not just the Brits. She said, Europe is dying. Any identifiable ethnic group, she said, needs a reproductive rate of 2.1 children per women, woman to sustain its own population over time. In Europe as a whole, the current rate is 1.38. In Britain, it's 1.79, but more of that in a moment. The lowest rate in, is in Spain at 1.16, a figure so low that there is no data recorded of a, any such population collapse ever recovering. And nowhere in the EU is the indigenous represent, reproductive rate above two, let alone 2.1. The highest is Ireland, would you believe, at 1.87. Back in Britain, the influx of people from the Indian subcontinent now distorts the national reproductive rate upwards, and that masks a crucial fact. The figure for the indigenous population is even lower than the 1.79 national average because the growing Muslim ethnic groups from Pakistan and Bangladesh are included within our national statistics. And according to the 2001 census, they average a reproductive rate of five. That is almost three times the indigenous population's performance. And Muslim women living in the EU as a whole have a reproductive rate of 3.5. Now, not only is this well above sustainability, but it unambiguously demonstrates the unavoidable consequences if this trend continues. Our Muslim population in the UK will overtake the indigenous population in terms of sheer numbers within 50 years. Meanwhile, the more Muslim immigrants we accept will simply accelerate that trend reduce the time frame, probably exponentially. Professor Philippe Rushton from Canada also spoke at this conference and he put the same point in a different way. He said, the birth rate of the immigration, uh, immigrant population of the UK currently averages 15 times the indigenous population. Not that we are the only country facing such a change on such a massive scale over such a short period. You in the US have similar problems, at least in the sense of an average reproductive rate amongst all races of 2.2, with your migrant population well ahead of the rest. So on both sides of the Atlantic, the indigenous populations will become minorities in their own countries within one lifetime as things stand at the moment. And from that stark statement, many important fundamental questions arise. When I ask you all, are we likely to see an Hispanic in the White House with his finger on the nuclear trigger? Think about it. 
When will we have a Muslim Prime Minister in the UK with a majority party in the House of Commons introducing Sharia law in the UK? To stop this from happening, we have first to restore the right of the British people to govern themselves. We have to close our borders with a moratorium of maybe five years and we have to sort this immigrant mess out once and for all and put a stop to it on an uncontrolled basis.